did any of you see my talk yesterday? Okay. Would you like to maybe kind of continue that discussion, maybe go over some ideas, Python a little bit more? Or you want to do something? What do you guys want to talk about? You want to talk about that or something else? No, no, we're talking about uh, small, low-powered devices that you can use to, like, hack stuff. Um. And so, uh, given, given this impromptu talk, I'll give an impromptu pimping of my book. It's <laughs> what I talked about is described in my book, which is available, Amazon, also cheaper at the publisher. Uh, hacking and penetration testing with low power devices. I also do have a couple copies if anyone wants to buy them. Um, I'll give you a better price than Amazon. <laughs> but anyway, enough about that. Um, as an alternative, uh, we could talk a little bit about the Python stuff I talked about in that talk. Also, in my book, I talk about how you can, in a semi-automated way, make your own Linux distro. I don't know if that's more interesting to you guys or what. So, what do you guys think? Who wants to talk Python? Well, I wrote a book on both of those. So, uh, who wants to talk, uh, make your own Linux distros? Okay. This is going to be a real impromptu talk. I told Amanda, I'm like, I got a whole bunch of presentations on my laptop. Yes, sir. Um, this is actually contained within my book, the one I was just pimping out. Um, here you go. I'll make it easy. Hacking and penetration testing with low-power devices. But um, all right, so here's a, kind of a brief story. I developed my own Linux distro to run on the Beagle family. Who's familiar with the Beagle board, BeagleBone? Okay, I know some of my students are. But um, so I developed this stuff to run on the Beagles. And originally, what I did is I started out, uh, I had done some USB work a few years back with USB forensics and microcontrollers. And I wanted to update that and upgrade it so that I could work with um, high speed devices, not just full speed USB devices and things like that. And so I started doing some work with the Beagle board. And after a little bit into that, I'm like, hey, this is like a really sweet piece of hardware, and it's a huge waste just to do this one little thing with it. So I should do some pen testing stuff with it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do some work with that. Next thing I knew, I was writing my own pen testing distro. And uh, the funny thing is, I had submitted a talk for 44Con. Uh, I, I talked about USB at the first one, and at the second one, I said, okay, well, I'm going to talk about this new stuff with USB, and I almost forgot to add the USB stuff because I got so excited and so carried away, like making my own distro with all this pen testing goodness in it. And then I came back, and I'm like, oh, I should actually do some USB forensic stuff, which I did at the very end. Well, anyway... Um, so I developed that a little further, and I added this idea of being able to control multiple hacking devices remotely uh, using XB and ZigBee mesh networking and things like that from up to a mile away, and life was good. And then the BeagleBone Black came out, right? And if you know anything about ARM devices, you'll know that the BeagleBone Black was the very first ARM-based device to use device trees. Any of you know about device trees? Heard about them? Okay. So I hadn't heard about them either. Uh, here's the short story on device trees. Device trees are something that were mandated by a guy called Linus. Uh, 
Anyone heard of this guy? He made some sort of operating system called Linux. But anyway, uh, up until about a year and a half ago, if you had a ARM-based device and you're running Linux on it, you had to hack your own kernel. So you wrote, would write your own kernel patches and you would maintain all that. And the ARM-based world was a huge freaking mess, right? And so they said, well, this isn't good. So we're going to come up with this thing called a device tree, and the device tree describes the hardware, right? So it describes the hardware that's getting used, and all of that, um, you have the manufacturer of each board creates a device tree, stores that file, and everyone uses the same kernel now. So this is a really good thing. However, BeagleBone Black was the very first device to use this, right? which meant everything was different in terms of interfacing new hardware to your existing systems, and this made life very difficult. All right. Okay, so why does that matter for making your own distro? This is why it matters. Right? Initially, I'd made the deck, which is my distro, by hand. All right. I just kind of started with Ubuntu, I added packages as I liked, and that's how I did it. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that works. Well, with the BeagleBone Black, I couldn't just take what I had and then say, oh, I'm going to port it. You know, I'm just going to copy it over to BeagleBone Black because the BeagleBone Black had a new kernel that was totally different, and there were no hacked kernels, earlier kernels, available for it. So I was stuck. I'm like, I got to start from scratch. I got to do this over again. So I said, well, okay, the second time around, I'm going to do this smartly, right? Is that a word? I don't know. It's late on a Friday. But so what I did is I said, all right, what am I going to do? And I came up with this idea. I said, I'm going to start with a Christmas list. All right, so I have a Christmas list. which is not going to come up there unless I do this. Now it's not coming up anywhere. Try it again. There we go. Okay. So I came up with a Christmas list and I said, here is all the packages I want. All right. So I start with generic Ubuntu. Uh, initially I was using Ubuntu 12.04. And I said, I'm just going to come up with something new. And uh, the DEC 2.0, which came out coinciding with this book, this book, which is available for sale. No. Um, anyway, so when that book came out, I released this new version of the DEC, which is now based on Ubuntu 14.04. And the awesome thing about that is I use this completely automated process to do that. To go from 1204 to 1404 was like nothing, literally. All right, so here's the idea. Uh, you start out with your Christmas list, and here I've got, you know, like 6,000 things that I want installed on my system. And then I have a series of scripts. And I have one here that's called Install Christmas. So here's a shell script. I don't know why that's interesting. The other one, it's like, hey, I should open it with gedit, but since you're a script, I'm going to use Emacs instead. All right, we'll just open them all in gedit. All right, so it's a pretty uh, simple shell script, and what does it do? Uh, first, it does an app get update. Uh, how many of you are familiar with shell scripts? Okay, little. Justin's like, I heard about a shell script once. Yeah. Okay, so uh, shell scripts can be really powerful, and sometimes people tend to go to their comfort zone, and they're like, Python, right? How many of you are familiar with Python? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, for, you know, running other programs and things like that, shell scripts tend to be a little bit better. If you're trying to do a lot of processing, Python can be better. So. For this stuff, I use shell scripts. And let me just walk you through this script really quickly. 
Uh, what it does, first you do an app get update, and then we um, remove old versions of two files if they exist. So I have an apt installable and a to do packages list. All right. So what happens is I remove those and I have a little method here called check dpackage and it checks to see is this package already installed. All right. If it's not, it tries to install it. All right. It tries to find it and install it. So here you can see I say if dpackage dash dash list, all right, what that does is it'll put out a list of all the packages you have installed. And then I'm going to pipe that to awk. If you're not familiar with shell scripts, you're probably not familiar with awk. Awk is a really simple tool. Uh, awk print dollar sign two just says print the second column for the output, and I pass that to egrep, and I check for the package name, possibly with an arm hf or arm hard float suffix, and maybe some other stuff, and I take the results, and I pipe all of the errors to dev null, because I really don't care. I'm really just trying to see if this returns true, right? if it found something, if this egrep returned something, that's all I care about. If it did, then I echo, yay, this package is already installed. Um, and then I say it's already installed, so it's put into apt installable, all right? So I started Christmas list, now that's gone to my list of installable packages. All right. If it's not already installed, I'm going to try to install it. So I try to install it, and I do an apt get dash y install. What's the dash y do? Does anyone know? It says yes to any prompts. Because you don't want your script sitting there going yes or no, especially if you've got 6,000 packages. All right, it's going to suck. All right, so I say, all right, do you try to install it? Again, put errors to dev null. And if that succeeds, I get all happy, and I add that. Um, some of you probably know this, but when you pipe something to a file or redirect it, if you use two greater than signs, it'll append. So I'm just appending it to the end of my list, saying, yep, I installed it. Otherwise, I put it in this to-do list. All right? Pretty simple. So if I look further in my script. So that's just a function. And I say while read package. So it's going to read in my list. Do check the package till done and it's going to read in this file. Right? You might not be familiar with the syntax if you don't do uh, shell scripting, but that's what that means. You, you might think a while loop. Okay, I understand that. Basically, I'm inputting this Christmas list.txt file and just looping through it. Okay? Everyone's still with me? I know it's late, it's Friday, and this was totally impromptu. But, okay. So the output from that is going to be a list of packages that are installable um, based on that. And I'm going to have this to do list. So now, once I have this to-do list, I'm going to uh, have to create a downloads list. So I'll go ahead and open this. Right. And it says at the top, okay, um, this is a script that's going to iterate over this to-do list. And, and it's a little note originally created by me for this book right here, this one. That's for sale, but um, <laughs> anyway. And here's what it does. I have a ability, you can set your browser. And again, I'm gonna remove old versions of outputs. So it has packages to download and source to download, right? 
So it's going to do this. The first thing it's going to do, it's going to try and find a package, right? So it'll it'll go through the list. You mean maybe there was some stuff on the list. You, you put it on your Christmas list, but you're like, okay, if I don't get this for Christmas, I'm not going to be too upset. I'm just going to consider it a bonus. So the first thing it's going to do is say, hey, do you want to try to find this thing out there? And it reads the response. And if you said no, then it's going to say, all right, I'm just going to say build from source. And if you said yes, then it's, you know, it's going to say, let me try to find it, right? Or you can say yes or no, or you can drop it like it's hot, right? You can just say, I don't care, screw this package, all right? And so then what it'll do is launch a browser. It's going to do a launch a browser and do a Google search. Right? So I have a little regular expression here, creates a Google search, and it'll bring up a list. And from there, you can enter a URL, right? You can browse around through the results. You find one that says, oh, here's a Debian file. So you can use that. Or maybe you don't find one. Okay. After that, it'll say, um, did you find it? And whatever you found, it's going to say enter the download D URL or just press enter. Enter means I didn't find anything, sorry. Um, and then it'll say, is that a Debian package or not? Right? If it's a Debian package, it goes to the source to download list. If it's not, it goes to the packages to download list. All right? You guys with me? It's pretty basic, right? Can you break it down? Well, but it's way better than doing this by hand. No, I think it's interesting. You're educating yourself, launching a web browser to find the thing that you need. And, that and I will say this, 80% um, plus of all of the packages were available in the standard repositories. So, yeah, I'm not going through this for 6,000 packages. I may be going through this for 500 packages, if that. I don't honestly remember how many. It was, uh, but it was just, just a few. And so you iterate over your list, and you make your list. Okay, so you're, we're getting there. So now we figured out source Debian package. It's time for another script. So let's download and install any of these packages. All right. So it's going to use wget. It's going to set a variable to be equal to wherever wget is using which. You guys familiar with the which command? Where it's, what's it going to run? Which things it going to run? You run that. Check for your file. Iterate over the list. Download your stuff using wget. And then you go ahead and install it. Or you try. Hopefully it doesn't fail. Right. Why might it fail? Dependencies, exactly. That's the other reason like you want to use apt-get if you can, because all those dependencies will automatically be taken care of. So it's going to try to do it. Uh, it also does some sanity checking. Like if it doesn't look like a Debian file, it's going to say, this doesn't look like a Debian file, are you sure? Um, and you can still try. Um, install a Debian file is pretty easy. sudo dpackage-i and then the name of your file that you just downloaded into a temp folder. All right. And here we just kind of iterate over the list. All right. So we're almost done. This is now at least 95% of your stuff that's been done. And then there's one last script, download and install source. 
This one is slightly more complicated. All right, because you're going to go through and you got to put in a bunch of flags. Because install source, what kind of source? Is it C? Is it Python? Is it, you know, who knows what? Right? Most of the time it's probably C, right? And you download a source package. Um, is it a Git? Is it on GitHub? Is it somewhere else? Is it a tar? Is it a tar XZ? A tar GZ? Who knows, right? So this, this script is a little bit more complicated and then it's going to look at some of these things. So first of all, I set up uh, some cross-compile flags. Uh, by the way, cross-compile, what's cross-compiling? I'm doing all this stuff on my desktop. Yeah, because I want it for ARM. Yeah. Now, I can run this on the Beagle directly. And I've done it, I've done it both ways. But it's kind of up to you. Um, compiling directly on the Beagle is a lot simpler. Uh, it's a lot more likely to work, but it's also a little bit slower than if you have a really nice desktop. So, you know, here I'm trying to figure out what kind of a board I might be running and try to do a local build if it's set that way, which normally that's the way I run it. Right. So you want to download your file. And what's the easiest way to make it? First thing I'm going to do is say, is there a make file? If there's a make file, I'm going to run make, make install, hope it works, right? If not, I'm going to try configure, right? And if that works, Good. If it failed, I'm going to try something else. And what if it's Python? I'm going to look for setup.py. All right. It's not rocket science. I said it was a little more complicated and say it was awesome. Okay. I don't claim to be an awesome Python guy. Um, what about a tarball? All right. So it's a little function that'll install from a tarball. Well, first of all, you got to figure out how to untar it, which might involve um, using compression or decompression, I should say. Right. So I have some simple reg expressions that will kind of try to figure out what your file is. By the way, thankfully, when you do an extract on tar, you can just say, yeah, A, this A flag. See that it says tar X A F. That's the automatic extract. So it's like, it goes, oh, it's a GZ file. It's an XZ file or a BZ2 file. All right. So I don't have to parse all that crap myself. I'm making my life a little simpler. Um, then what if it's a Git file? All right. If it's a Git file, I call Git clone. And yep, some people are still using subversion. So this is an attempt to install using subversion. And here's a download to download the source package. And here's just a loop where I'm going to iterate over my file. And download, try to install. This, this thing is going to try to pick the appropriate, you know, install from a tarball, install from Git, install from SVN, etc. Okay, so it's a little bit of logic there, not too much. And all right, so at this point, you've gotten almost everything you want, and then there's a couple of packages that are just a total pain in the butt, right? And what can you guess is the biggest pain in the butt to install anywhere? Metasploit. Why? Because I have a separate shell script. All right, so he's using deductive logic, right? He noticed, 
all the files I have up here. And he saw, you know, I have install word lists. It just goes out, grab some word lists. That's pretty basic. Install wireless tools, same thing, fairly basic uh, deal. And I have a install Metasploit. And the reason that Metasploit is such a pain in the butt is that Metasploit requires a specific version of Ruby, which is not shipping in any freaking Linux distro in the world. All right. So if you try to install Metasploit with anything other than, you know, Ruby 1.93, whatever, it doesn't work. All right. So the first thing you got to do is install the appropriate version of Ruby. And then you still have to do some more stuff. And guess what? There's a bunch of dependencies. And then you got to install Metasploit and get it out of the um, Git hub. Now, some of you might say, why should I bother to get it from GitHub, right? I could get it instead just from Rapid7, right? right. Nobody here works for Rapid7, right? <laughs> just... Um, I mean, I did I tell did tell some of those guys flat out. I'm like, yeah, your stuff was like a real bitch to install. <laughs> I mean, literally, it took me days to get this to work the first time. Um, it took me longer to install Metasploit and then to update my entire OS with these scripts and stuff. But um, anyway, it is kind of a pain in the butt. Just so you can see what the tools look like. Um, could you go to the Rapid7 website and just download Metasploit and install it? No. Why not? Because it is, is available as a Debian package, right? So that's one thing. It is available. However, um, guess what? They flagged that Debian package is only working with Intel chips. What's Metasploit written in? Ruby, a scripting language. Is Ruby a scripting language available for ARM? Yes, it is. Uh, by the way, it's not just Rapid7, but there are other people out there. They have a nice Debian package, but they flagged it as only working for Intel architectures, even though it's 100% based on Python or Ruby or something similar. And it would work perfectly. So because of that flaw, I would say, um, from the manufacturer, you have to get the stupid code yourself. There is a plus, though. If you get it off the GitHub, you don't have this, you must register. Uh, it's open source. Why am I registering it? I don't know. I don't get that. But anyway, so here is how we can install uh, Metasploit. Again, I have the same install D package. Um, I have to install support packages. And here's a list of support packages. You can see there's quite a few, right? So you've got build essential and all this other stuff. And again, it took me a couple days to work this out first time. Um, then you have to get the correct version of Ruby. To get the correct version of Ruby, you have to use the Ruby version manager. So you can use curl to download this stuff. And, you know, this is very simple, very simple command, right? Just do all this. You know, and again, Ruby 193 has to be that version, not better, not worse. All right. And then you want to get the code from GitHub. So you get the code from GitHub, download it using git clone. Now you have to install the gems, install the bundler, and then use bundle install. And if you've been a good person, you probably have a working Metasploit. All right. Um, so that was how I did that little bit. All right. Any questions? Uh, hopefully this is sort of coherent. I know I'm a little tired and it's late and this was not planned, but 
Um, all right. No questions? Awesome. I know that we're sort of a little early, but uh, unless there's something else, is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Or? It can, by default, it doesn't have PoE support. And I actually, uh, you know, I talk a lot about power usage and what kind of uh, runtime would you get with different kinds of batteries and things like that. And I actually mentioned that in the talk I gave yesterday. Um, and the thing about PoE is up until I just took my job at Bloomsburg University, I'd never seen an office in the U.S. using PoE. Yeah, I, I, I never did a pen test anywhere where they were using PoE. Well, and we have Cisco phones. You guessed it. Um, so at first, I started out trying to roll my own PoE module for the Beagle because I thought, oh, this should be simple. But then I started looking at the PoE spec. It's not simple, guys. All right? There are multiple versions of PoE. Right? The super simple version uses a couple of the wires in that bundle that aren't used, and it sends power down it. But it's not the only version. <laughs> there are some other versions that will send power signals down data lines. And you're like, Oh, how do I deal with that? And there's a mechanism for determining what kind of stuff you have. And uh, so I'm like, okay, I, my first plan was I'll just tap into those power lines and, you know, I'll regulate it down to five volts. It shouldn't be a big deal. But then I started looking at it. I'm like, how do I know that they're not using some other form of PoE? That could be a problem for me if they are. And so I decided you know what, uh, until I run into this, I'm not going to bother. And the thing that really decided it for me is you can buy little PoE modules that you could just plug in, in line, and then put them on your Beagle. And I'm like, all right, if I can buy a device for 20 bucks, if there's ever were to occur, I'm just going to buy the device. So, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely they don't use a lot of power. It's less than two watts, so you could do PoE. Um, yeah, and yeah, the um, the other thing is you can use solar to supplement or completely do it with solar. So you know, I did some calculations, and depending on the size of the solar panel, if you have a uh, I just went through four of them that add a fruit cells. And if you have the second biggest one, depending on what you're doing, you can run forever or for at least 125 hours based on certain assumptions. And if you buy the biggest one they sell, you can run forever no matter what you're doing with the Beagle. So there's a couple of different possibilities there. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for sticking around. Sorry that the other guy didn't come. I was actually thinking about going to that talk too, and I just wandered into a different one. But. No problem.